Welcome, folks, to our Friday series, Cosmic Conversations. My name is Josh. I'm part of the Morrison Planetarium team at the California Academy of Sciences, and I am excited to be here with some of our experts from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science with Kachun Yu and Bob Reynolds. We're going to be talking about some of the awesome stuff we see on planet Earth that tells us about the structure that's going on inside our planet, as well as where we see those things elsewhere in our solar system. So with that, I will hand it off. Kachun, can you tell us a little bit about the software we're using today? Okay, so we are looking at open space, checking out the surface of planet Earth. And while we're getting Kachun back on, looks like we are having a brief technical hiccup. Uh, we're going to be checking stuff out in the open space software, looking at the surface of planet Earth in the open space software, which allows us to see not only the cool details we have here on our planet in wonderful resolution, but also see some of the structures of planet Earth. Okay, so with that, I think Kachun is back. Yep. We should be ready Hi, everyone. to go. You want to tell us a little bit about open space? Sure, it's a um, software that's um, sponsored uh, and funded by NASA. It comes out of the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and both the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, which Bob and I are, are part of, as well as the California Academy of Sciences, are partners with the software in helping to develop it and to use it for programs like this. And we've been using it at Denver in some of our uh, live streaming uh, shows. And with that, I think uh, since we have a uh, um, action-packed program, in that, that much time, I'm going to hand it over to Bob, who will be talking about the Earth, uh, but then we'll be flying off to another world in the solar system at the end. Great. Well, thanks, Kachun, and uh, thanks, you guys in California for helping us uh, do this, and we're delighted to join you from Denver. Uh, I'm located just north of Denver in Longmont, and Kachun's down in Denver, and we're both in our respective homes, but we're delighted to be able to put this programming together and to share uh, some of these wonderful views of the Earth. Our program today, we're, we're interested in looking at the uh, patterns of, of plate tectonics or continental drift as seen from above. And we'll start out with a view of, uh, of the globe, and we might look at the South Atlantic just to get ourselves uh, oriented. And uh, the point to be made here is that if you look at this pattern, uh, which many of you have done, I'm sure, uh, on a globe, it's, it's pretty easy to see the match between the margins of South America and Africa. And many people will have looked at that. I remember as a, as a grade school child looking at a globe and saying, gosh, it looks like those things must fit together. And uh, then once you get the bathymetry of the ocean, you'll see there's a mid-ocean ridge. We call it the mid-Atlantic ridge in this case. And it certainly makes a, a even more compelling story when you see that there's a symmetry about not only the, the margins of the continents, but also the water depths in the ocean. And it turns out that the mid-Atlantic Ridge is the place where uh, uh, drifting or, or rifting is taking place. And those uh, continental masses indeed are moving apart. We're going to now go over to, uh, we're going to cross Africa. And uh, we're setting this up so we'll give a, an illustration of how continental drift happens in places where it's really pretty easy to see it from space. And then we're going to come across to uh, the North American plate and we're going to work our way to California. So uh, at the end of our Earth views, we'll be looking at California. But we're going to start here with a, a, this view of the Red Sea. And just like you saw in the South Atlantic, I think you can appreciate that the margins of the Red Sea are, are pretty symmetrical. And uh, actually, as a graduate student, I had an exercise where we, and we had maps of the Red Sea. And we used scissors, and we cut the thing apart and practiced sticking it back together using literally cutting the map and gluing it back together. And it worked pretty well. Of course, today we'd do it digitally, we'd be more sophisticated, but the, the net effect is similar. As we move up the Red Sea, uh, you can see there are two gulfs at the north end. Uh, the Gulf of Suez is straight ahead, and the Gulf of Aqaba is to the uh, right, and the Sinai Peninsula is between the two. And I want to show a model here. Let's, let's back up a little bit, Kachin, before we get too, too deeply into this. Uh, of the way this whole system is working, just sort of an overview. And you've got the Nile River, the Nile Delta, the Mediterranean, Cyprus there in the central part of the scene. But if we look at the whole Arabian Peninsula, 
uh, here we'll get it sort of centered. Uh, you can appreciate that the Red Sea is extending. We just talked about that. And the, the net effect on the other side of the system is compression. So you've got pulling apart on one side and pushing together on the other. So the Persian Gulf area on the right is compressing. And I have a little block diagram of this, which I'll, I'll try to show here. Uh, I'm gonna uh, bring it up so that you guys can see it. And in, in principle, uh, I've just cut this out out of a piece of paper, but you can see the Arabian Peninsula there with the arrows on it, and I can move it with a sophisticated tool here. And uh, you can get a feeling for how it's, it's the Red Sea's opening and it's crashing into the Zagros Mountains. And then there's a strike slip fault uh, with a red stripe on it over uh, near the Dead Sea. So you get that, that picture, and now we're going to go look at it uh, from space. So here, as we zoom into the north end of the Red Sea, uh, the Gulf of Aqaba is a strike slip zone. Uh, the Gulf of Suez is pulled apart a little bit, but it's stopped in the Miocene. And then the motion is now taken up almost entirely on the Gulf of Aqaba. And the Gulf of Aqaba is a narrow gulf, as you can see there. Uh, it comes in, it's got the Sinai Peninsula on the left, it's got the uh, Saudi Arabia on the right. And as you, we head up to the north end of, the, uh, of, of this uh, gulf, uh, you'll come to the town of Aqaba, which some of you will remember from Lawrence of Arabia. He, he actually conquered the town by surprising people by coming in overland on his camels up at the very north end of the uh, Gulf of Aqaba here. The town of Aqaba is there. Now, as we go north up along this trend, we're going to be following what's really a strike-slip fault. So plates have places where they pull apart, they have places where they push together, and then they have places where they slide side by side. And those of you in California are familiar with that, but this is a place where it's sliding side by side. The area on the right-hand side is moving north or up, north away from us relative to the side on the left. And as we come up, we're passing uh, Petra, uh, we've got Jordan on the right, and uh, we're gonna come up here to the southern end of the Dead Sea, and you'll see they're evaporating the salty water, just like they do in the south side of the bay in uh, near San Jose. And they're the petrochemical facilities uh, that are benefiting from the salt here from the, from the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, as you know, is the lowest place on the surface of the earth. It's in this, uh, there's an area in the strike slip fault here where the, there's a sort of a jag in the pattern uh, netting the, the result of a very high subsidence rate, tectonic subsidence rate. So there's a very low area here, well below sea level. And the level of the Dead Sea is also falling. It used to be falling about a meter a year. So the lowest point on Earth was going down about a meter a year. I think it probably still is because there's limited amount of water coming in. And of course, there's huge amounts of evaporation in this area. The, the primary source of water into the Dead Sea is the, the Jordan River, which we're coming up to uh, right here. You can see the mouth of the Jordan River. It's feeding down into the Dead Sea. There's not much water in, the, in this river anymore because it's primarily used for irrigation, as you can see on both sides of the river. Uh, it, it's coming, uh, flowing down out of the uh, Lake Galilee, which is up on, coming up on the horizon. And uh, Again, limited water. This is an area that's tremendously water uh, starved and uh, limited water resources, very effective recycling going on. But the linear pattern, you see sort of a linear trend as we head up towards the uh, Sea of Galilee or the Lake Galilee. That's the uh, strike slip fault, uh, which is a plate boundary between, in this case, the Arabian plate on the right and what we'd have would be the, we might call it the African or the, or the European plate on the left. Now, what happens in this in the territory we're coming up in towards uh, Lebanon and Syria, and here there's a big arcuate fold belt called the Palmyran Folds, and they swing across. We're near Damascus now. Uh, these are swinging across to the right, to the east, and we'll eventually maybe back out a teeny bit, Kachun, so we'll get the overview. Uh, we'll cross the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and we'll be coming in towards the area uh, of the Persian Gulf. So up ahead is the uh, Euphrates first and then the Tigris up in the distance. Again, very arid ground. These waters come out of Turkey. They flow into Iraq. 
and uh, we've got uh, Baghdad sort of in the middle of the scene here. And as we as we start to see the Persian Gulf on the right, you see the fold belt now on the left hand side of the screen. And these folds are magnificently well exposed. And again, one of the reasons for using this area as a teaching tool, uh, as you extend in the Red Sea, you compress over on the, the, this side of the system. And this is the Zagros mountain chain, a very interesting and beautiful mountain chain. <laughs> and uh, it's got uh, fabulous exposures of, of uh, these are called anticlines. There's places where there's salt coming up. There's some salt glaciers. Uh, we might just catch and fly over some salt glaciers and then we're heading uh, uh, further out. We could back out a little bit just to keep our, our uh, geometry good. So let's, let's, let's back up and just um, make sure everyone's seeing the Zagros Mountains nicely. Uh, you've got the, the Persian Gulf, the Delta of the Tigris and Euphrates there, and this big folded belt. Um, you can, you'll see the fold belt there on the north side or the east side of the uh, Persian Gulf. So the basic picture is the material on the lower left is moving to the right, and you've got extension in the Red Sea, compression in the Zagros Mountains. Now we can carry these thoughts over. Let's go over to, uh, we'll cross the Makran range and we'll look just quickly at Pakistan and Afghanistan. And I'm doing this again to sort of set us up for our studies uh, in North America in a couple of minutes. So you've got the green ground on the right is Pakistan and India. The gray ground or brown in the middle is Afghanistan. And there's a big north-south feature that separates Pakistan from Afghanistan. And that again is a plate boundary. It's called the Chaman Fault. It's a place where there's a strike slip motion with the right hand side moving north and the left hand side moving relatively south. And you'll see the linear trends in the central part of the screen here. Uh, and that's called the Chaman Fault. It's a very active fault deforming today. Uh, there's some folding going on on the right, which is the Suleiman Range. <clears throat> and that that uh, active strike slip fault is the boundary between the Pakistan, India plate and Afghanistan. Afghanistan is actually being squeezed out to the left. Uh, we call it escape tectonics, and it's uh, being pushed away out to the left. The whole system, of course, is part of the greater Himalayan range, and you'll see coming up, we might just get a quick view of the Himalayas before we head back to uh, North America. So we'll, we're looking at the Pamirs, uh, the Karakorams, K2, Nanga Parbat, famous mountains are right there. Uh, snow-capped ahead of you. The Peshawar Basin, uh, in the distance, the Kashmir Basin, uh, the frontier between uh, Pakistan and India, and up to the north would be Tibet. But I think in the interest of time, uh, we've got to keep moving. Uh, and so let's go back to, we'll back out a little bit. We can do a whole program on the Himalayas sometime. It's, it's a fleeting glance, but a wonderful place. The, the Tarian Basin, the Tibetan Plateau. But we're going to pull ourselves back home. And uh, I now want to look at the North American plate in toto, meaning in all, and uh, ask ourselves, well, where are the plate boundaries or the margins of these semi-rigid plates in North America? And uh, we have fun doing this with students, and we've done this many times with our audiences at the Denver Museum. If we look at this view of North America, and I ask you, where are the plate margins? Uh, we can uh, see if anybody's guessing where the plate margins are. But the, on the right-hand side or the east side, where, where do you think the plate margin is on the right side of the North American um, plate? And I see a, I'm seeing a limited number of guesses coming in on the chat. But Mary's probably seeing more of them. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the answer, I'll just quickly give it away just because we've got to get to California. But the answer is that eastern side, the, the plate boundary is the mid-Atlantic ridge, so way out in the middle of the ocean. And you can see that if you go to Iceland, it comes up above uh, water level. So the plate margin on the east side, or on the right side of the North American plate, is the mid-Atlantic ridge. And then on the west side, we'll go scooting over to uh, the Gulf of California. And of course, you guys in California are much more familiar with this side of it. And uh, I hope you know that your plate margin out here is actually the San Andreas Fault. So we're going to take the next few minutes to 
look at the geology and geometry of the San Andreas. Uh, it originates down in the Gulf of California, Sea of Cortez, which is an obliquely extending ocean basin, a lot like the Red Sea uh, patterns. Now, maybe it's not so clear that in terms of fitting the sides back together again, probably because it's so obliquely extending, but a narrow, very young ocean basin, the Sea of Cortez. If we go up to the north end of it, of course, the Colorado River is coming in there, uh, and we're in, uh, we've got Baja on the, on the left, and we've got northern Mexico on the right, and we're coming up towards the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, and you can see the Salton Sea is sort of a landmark up ahead, and you'll see the fertile ground irrigated, uh, the Imperial Valley, the uh, sort of a breadbasket area there. As we cross the Salton Sea, we come up north, we're heading up towards the Mojave Desert. We've got the Los Angeles area on the left, the LA Basin, and then we've got the Mojave Desert in the center. And here, very interesting geology, there's a volcano uh, that has been rent asunder by the San Andreas Fault. And uh, it's, it's called the Ninach Volcano. And it's the right-hand side of it is right near that little lake that's in the center of the screen. Uh, there's a zone there full of volcanic rock that's very distinctive and it's been studied hard by geologists. The trend, the linear trend in the middle of the screen, north-south is the San Andreas Fault. But right in this area near some of this irrigation are the uh, Ninaj Volcanics. And I, I point this out to you because we're going to drive north along the fault and we're going to find the other side of the volcano uh, that's been dragged a long ways to the north. I'll, we'll get there in a few minutes. But here you can see the linear trends. We're going to scoot up north along it. Uh, San Andreas is defined by a wide variety of, of uh, geomorphic features, which include ridges and linear valleys. And it took a long time for geologists to realize how much offset has been present on this huge fault. But after the 1906 earthquake, a lot of people studied the San Andreas, and there was early speculation that it was a huge, very long fault. But the, the significance of the offset was really nailed down by people studying the geology on both sides of this feature. And we'll get to that when we get up a little bit further north. But we've got a scoop north here. We're crossing the Carrizo Plains, and we're going to head up past, uh, we're going to move up so we get up near Paso Robles, and uh, we're going to see the Monterey Bay coming up a little bit in a minute. Uh, but as we get up closer towards the town of Hollister, and, and we've got a I'm pulling ourselves north here, uh, we're going to come up to a place called the Pinnacles, which is some of these green mountains that are starting to be visible here on the left-hand side. And uh, the Pinnacles volcanics uh, actually represent the other side of that volcano that we talked about earlier. And so we've got one side of the volcano on the left-hand side of the fault, the other side of the volcano on the right-hand side, and the offset is about 200 miles. And geologists can date the volcanic rocks, and the volcano is about 23 million years old, and it's about 200 miles separated by the fault. And so when you do the arithmetic, it comes out to about a half an inch per year of offset. And that's the, that's the number that we think is about right. In fact, we can measure it uh, using GPS. So we, we use detailed measurements from GPS and they corroborate the geological observations. We've got to continue north here, uh, Kachun, so that we can get ourselves Bob, up. We got a real quick question. Was there yeah. more volcanic activity in Earth's past than there was today? Well, that's a good question about the volcanoes. We, we do see uh, times in the Earth's past when there was more volcanic activity. Uh, for example, the Columbia River basalt flows up in Washington, Oregon, would represent a time of great volcanic outpouring. But uh, there's a pretty general rhythm of vol volcanism that's very much still active today. And, and every single year, there's not necessarily a big volcanic eruption, but volcanologists are keenly aware that there's a lot of activity. We've got the Salinas Basin here uh, in the foreground. The San Andreas Fault's actually a bit to the right. Uh, but there's a whole string of faults that are parallel to the San Andreas. The San Andreas is just the currently active strand of this plate boundary. And for those of you who live in Berkeley or the, know about the, the fault underneath the Berkeley Stadium, it's one of the strands of the fault. And down here, there's the Nascimento Fault, which is parallel to the San Andreas. Now we're coming up to the Southern Bay Area. We just crossed over Hollister, where the fault is moving every day a little bit. 
and now we're in the Southern Bay Area, San Jose and Cupertino and whatnot. And uh, here the fault is stuck and hasn't moved since 1906. And it's built up a lot of pent up uh, energy strain because of the, uh, of the uh, half an inch movement per year. And so the Bay Area is uh, in a pretty challenging situation where we, the geologists know there's been a tremendous amount of buildup of stress and it will someday release. So we're gonna come in, fly in low over the Cal Academy and then we're going to head ourselves up towards the, uh, uh, we'll go up towards Point Reyes and then we'll transition to Kachun. So we're just looking at the San Francisco area here. And of course, those of you who are at home in this area will recognize the roof of the Cal Academy right there. Interesting uh, topography on the roof. I think what the dome sticks up, is that something that's visible on the roof of the Cal Academy? Um, we got all sorts of weird stuff up on our roof. Yeah. Probably whale bones. <laughs> okay, well, there's your roof. So we just start flying over the roof of Cal Academy. And, and uh, just to keep our, our vantage point, uh, we'll take one last look at the uh, San Andreas system just offshore from the Golden Gate Bridge uh, over there towards uh, Point Reyes. And uh, you'll see a beautiful linear pattern, Point Reyes on the left, and then that goes right up along Tamales. Uh, bay, and, and that'd be the, uh, again, trace of the San Andreas Fault. But I think in the interest of time, we've uh, just, I'll quickly recap, we, we started with the symmetry seen in the South Atlantic and the Red Sea, and we looked at plates that, that are either uh, pulling apart or pushing together, or in the case of the San Andreas Fault, sliding side by side, and those are the patterns that are so common on the planet Earth. And now, Kachin, we'll just turn it over to you for a a, a sortie. Yeah, thank you very much, Bob. So um, what we're going to do is um, we're going to fly to another world where we see examples of tectonics, um, although there are no other planets or moons in our solar system that have click tectonics like the Earth does. But uh, some of you might be trying to guess where we are going. And let me see if I can get there quickly. We are, in fact, heading to the Jovian system. Here's the planet Jupiter. And we're headed to one of its moons. We're headed to the moon Europa, which is the smallest of the large Galilean moons. Europa is slightly sl smaller than our, than our moon. But what's really unique about it is that there is an icy shell made up of water ice that completely covers the surface. And there are very few craters, but what we see are numerous cracks on the surface. And so what we think is going on is that there is a subsurface ocean of water underneath um, that thick shell of ice and this water um, causes these, um, the, the, the hard shell um, to be more, more fluid and to move and to crack and the water can well up from underneath. And as Bob says, you know, there are a lot of features on the earth that we understand uh, by comparing them to other parts. And in fact, planetary geologists often start studying uh, the earth to understand um, how similar processes can work on other worlds. And we see the same sorts of faulting and behavior um, on Europa as we do um, on the Earth. And let's see if I can find um, one of these uh, features. We're actually going to a somewhat low resolution patch of the planet. But um, all these cracks are places where um, the surface has um, broken and spread apart. So this idea of, of extension of the, the surface spreading apart is something that we see on Europa, just like we do on the Earth. And here you see kind of this um, linear dark band that runs um, across horizontally, it kind of curves horizontally. It looks kind of low res, but I can actually bring up a higher resolution image. On the left is actually that band um, at high resolution. And you can see that on the, uh, the north and south sides of the band, there are similar features um, just like, and so this is very similar to the Red Sea that we had seen before. And the researchers have basically, in you know, I think using Photoshop, erased that band. And then just like you know, what Bob was talking about, taking pieces of paper, cutting them apart and smushing them back together, the picture on the left shows you what happens when you smush that back together. You see the two halves of Europa fit together almost perfectly.
there are other faults uh, that cross over um, from one side of that band to the other. And so here is an example of extension that takes place on a completely different world. And, it's pretty um, cool to think about high-tech so stuff like NASA. So we know Europa is a place where um, the entire surface of the moon is spreading apart. We actually don't have any good evidence of it compressing like we do on the Earth. So um, Europa is just a really bizarre uh, place, but we're seeing uh, very similar types of dynamics and tectonics as we do on the Earth, but in a completely um, strange and otherworldly environment. And so with that, uh, that's um, it for me. And I think uh, Bob and I are uh, both happy to take um, questions from the audience. Well, Mary I know I've got a question. Do you have any uh, <laughs> really burning questions that you think um, we can help answer? So uh, one question that came up I know I have is it's strange to think about a really high-tech process like Just taking- one other thing while we're waiting on them, I, I don't hear um, anyone is uh, fly back down um, to Europa. And, um, and there are actually lots of other examples of uh, places where uh, you see um, faults coming in. So here, if I zoom in, here, this dark um, streak that kind of runs diagonally um, through the center of the screen, um, that's another example where um, that dark band is a place where the ice has um, you know, pushed um, the, the surface apart, and then there are two um, horizontal bands that have come up. You haven't heard the host. No. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, well, Kachun seems to be working out some uh, tech hiccups on his side. No big deal. Uh, as soon as he's back on, we can add him back in. There we go. Yeah, sorry about that. It looks like uh, I'm frozen. Uh, so a question I have is, it's always kind of strange to think about something as high tech as satellite photography on another planet happening and then someone going in in Photoshop or cutting out the piece of paper and sticking it together. Are there other instances of tech like this being used where you've got something very high tech butting up against something that seems very, very low tech? Uh, I think, um, I mean, Europa is a pretty unique example just because the surface is so dynamic. This is a relatively young surface and we think you know, there are cracks that are forming uh, or are being reinforced on, um, on, on an orbital period cycle. Uh, Europa orbits uh, Jupiter every, um, I think, 80 hours or so. And so um, you know, these cracks are changing uh, very dynamically on, a sh on very short time scales. Um, the evidence for tectonics on uh, the other worlds, or uh, there's a lot less of that. Um, so Mars uh, nor Venus, neither of them have plate tectonics as, as we know it. And so um, they, even though we know, you know we have evidence that Venus might be volcanically active and there are more Mars quakes that we are detecting, um, they don't present the same types of tectonics as we see on Europa. That's a great question. So is there a specific planetary body that you find most interesting, Bob? Well, of course, uh, my favorite planet is the Earth. I'm a geologist, and so uh, I find that there's infinite uh, complexity and variety on the Earth. But one of the key things to, to underline here is that we, as geologists, we recognize patterns. And uh, the question earlier that Josh asked about high-tech, low-tech, uh, the, the geologists are a pretty good example of people that use a huge variety of tools. And some of it is sophisticated computers with computer modeling and plate reconstructions. And others are just out walking around in the field looking at rocks. And uh, for example, if you're in the Bay Area, uh, it's wonderful to go out hiking on the hills around the Bay Area. And you'll find amazing rock types uh, in the hills. You'll find bits of oceanic crust that have been squeezed up uh, along the plate margin. Uh, in the, it's, called, it's called a melange or a mixed up <laughs> zone of rocks that characterize the Bay Area geology. And uh, there's beautiful things to be seen. And you can see it just by taking a walk. So very low tech. And then you can fit it into something more sophisticated, like our story about continental drift and plate tectonics. Well, you gave a great shout out to my absolute favorite park, which is Pinnacle. So I give you a big thumbs up <laughs> for that. Dan St. John wants to know, what about the Mississippi River Fault? Well, the Mississippi River flows down uh, an ancient uh, fault system 
which is very old, goes back into the Mesozoic, maybe even earlier, uh, and it's been reactivated along something called the New Madrid Fault, uh, where there was a big earthquake back in the 1800s, and which is certainly has the potential of having another earthquake uh, today. Uh, a poorly understood fault in many ways. It's not in a plate margin situation today. It may have been in, in the past, but today the, uh, the Mississippi River system is flowing down. Uh, it, it, the trough is called an allocogen. There's all kinds of fancy names for things, but it's uh, a beautiful, uh, long-lived uh, river system guided by a very ancient fault system uh, that is uh, running up and down the, the axis of where the Mississippi goes into the Gulf of Mexico. There's some beautiful stuff you're showing us, Kachun. It's always so cool to pick out those geo features and satellite photography. But the same question for you. Do you have a favorite planetary body? That well, I, um, I'm actually not a planetary uh, scientist. I'm an astronomer, so I study um, star formation. And so, uh, so I, um, I don't come at this from a research perspective, but um, having worked with planetary software for close to 20 years now, and having developed a lot of it, um, and using a lot of these tools for our programs, I think, you know, um, from a more of a layperson's uh, perspective and enthusiasm, um, I really enjoy the Earth. And you know, having done uh, programs with Bob for over 10 years, I've gotten a real appreciation of the beauty of planet Earth from space um, and, uh, you know, being able to explore it with these tools that we have is pretty amazing. Uh, the fact that we can see imagery that was taken from satellites uh, orbiting you know, a couple hundred miles overhead and zooming down to surface details that would have been unheard of, you know, a decade or two ago. Absolutely. Yeah, we have a program, for example, uh, Earth as Art. So we're, we're putting it together for the Denver Museum. We're, we're just going to treat the Earth as, a, as our, our artist template, and we're going to look at a variety of fascinating patterns that, of course, have geological underpinnings, but have their own aesthetic beauty just as, as patterns and images. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't say there's a shout-out opportunity here. If you folks like this imagery and you want to check it out at home, one of the coolest things about open space is you can, you can download it and fly around just like Kachunin is doing. Maybe not as practiced as him, but if you give yourself some time, you'll get there. We had a question from Bing. Why do quakes in some part of the world like Chile or Alaska or the Middle East so, seem so much more violent than our lesser quakes in California? Well, I think that you've got to appreciate that the action uh, in plate tectonics is, is at the plate margins. And so pl different plate margins have different uh, stickinesses, if you can think about it that way. So, for example, if you live in Hollister, just south of San Jose, there's, there are little tiny earthquakes every day because the San Andreas Fault is moving bit by bit every day. But in the San Francisco Bay Area and down in the Los Angeles area, the fault has been stuck for, well, for over 100 years in the case of the San Francisco Bay. And when that fault moves, you'll, it's going to be big. It's going to be a magnitude 7 plus fault uh, earthquake. So uh, different plate margins have different styles of earthquakes. And uh, the challenge for us as geologists and seismologists and people studying the earth is to recognize that, that our time scale as humans is short because our lifespan is short and geology is long and, and vast and huge in time so uh, over geological time frames these plate margins are consistently active dynamically moving with lots and lots of earthquakes on a human time scale it might be that for a whole lifetime, there's no earthquake uh, at a given point. And then other times there might be several earthquakes in one lifetime. We have a fun planetarium show talking about those exact ideas. But I think we've hit our time limit. Thank you both for joining us here for our cosmic conversations. Thank you to Mary for being our super producer in the background. It's been a real joy. Do you have any parting words for our folks? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, well come, come to Denver. <laughs> yeah, come to Denver. Check out the rocks there. I'm sure you've got cool yeah. stuff at your museum. And come check out our programs online, too. We've mm -hmm. been posting them to YouTube. Great yeah. stuff on the Denver Museum YouTube channel if you folks want to check it out. Uh, on behalf of myself and Morrison Planetarium, thank you all for letting us into your homes to tune in for this special broadcast. We hope to see you at subsequent week's Cosmic Conversations. We've got cool programs happening on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays as well. But on behalf of myself and all of us and Open Space, thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.
Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.